All right. Welcome to Computer Science 50, Introduction to Computer Science 1. For those of you joining us today for the first time, my name is David Malin, and I will be your instructor this semester. If uh, we were not to start with what you're about to see, I think we would be remiss. For those of you joining us for the first time, know that what we're about to dive in today is a little something like this. So that is Raining Men by CS50's own Andrew Barry. More on that later today and then problem set zero. So in the yard on Monday, I actually bumped into one of you, a freshman who explained that not one but two of her advisors had rather recommended against her taking CS50 because it's hard, because it's scary. And she explained what her expected workload's going to be. I think she'll be taking Xbox this semester, a French class, and something else, but nothing in the category of a scary class or a lab-based course or anything like that. So this is only to say that the schedule that this girl described was sort of very typical. And it's hard to imagine ever taking CS50 if you shouldn't take CS50 while taking a language class or an Xbox class or a core class. So just realize that and considering during this shopping week whether or not to take this course, at least if you're on the fence, come chat with me or one of the teaching fellows or someone who's actually taken the course. And truth be told, I don't quite know who these two advisors are that are sort of telling all of their students not to take CS50. But know that certainly come up to us during office hours or right after class. And then we have this final should I session tomorrow afternoon from 4 to 5 PM right here, where it's really just casual Q&A if you simply have questions on your mind. So a couple of announcements before we dive into what you've just seen today. Uh, the course's lectures will be online in video format. Those of you who missed Monday's lecture know that it's already available online, both in flash format via the course's website. And also, you can follow the link to the course's so-called podcast. For those of you with iPods and iPhones, know that you can actually though I question uh, just how cool it would be to go walking around campus watching Computer Science 50 on your iPod. But know that you can, in fact, take us with you all around campus. And you can download the MP3s or movie files, so at least you can uh, access it while not actually connected to a network once you download the files. Uh, problem set zero is now the only new handout for today. It's not expected that you dive into this until after this Friday's lecture. And even then, only the scratch portion is really applicable, and not until after next Monday should you even feel like you need to dive into the Linux portion of this problem set, which is the second half. The purpose of this problem set is to give you one, hopefully a sense of accomplishment early in the semester where you'll actually produce your own graphical program, which you've seen here today in the form of Raining Men was, again, one of the teaching fellow's uh, implementations of a vision he had. And he went about implementing it in this language known as Scratch, which we will dive in today. And one additional announcement about problem sets in general, this problem set 
is only being released in a so-called standard edition, as we've dubbed it, for everyone in the course. But know, per the syllabus, that some problem sets during the semester will be released in so-called hacker edition form. Uh, those will be purely optional. They are an effort on our part, much like the recommended textbooks, to sort of have two unofficial tracks within the course, one for the broad majority of students who are either inexperienced with programming or simply a little uncomfortable with even being in this course in the first place, and then that minority of students who not only maybe took AP Computer Science, but did incredibly well in it, have been self-taught, have taught themselves a bit of C or C++ or even other languages as well, these so-called hacker editions will simply be written, spun from a more technical angle, present perhaps some more sophisticated questions, and will be generally tailored to that type of clientele. But it will be entirely up to you week to week which of these editions that you do pick up. But for this week, the point is moot, since uh, this problem set is for all to dive into. But more on that in the weeks to come. One announcement from our one of our head teaching fellows, Thomas here. Hi. Um, so there are, are going to be two uh, dinner things in Edinburgh. Um, so uh, Thomas, you have to be on Tuesday and Wednesday next week, 5:30 to 7. Um, feel free to drop by. There's going to be a bunch of professors there, including um, Professor Smith, who used to teach this class and recently became Dean Smith. Um, so if you just want to chat. Uh, if you're interested in coming and you're not a freshman, I don't. <laughs> okay, terrific. So this course is ultimately about problem solving and teaching you to think more methodically, more carefully, implementing your ideas more precisely. But toward that end, we use ultimately programming as the framework in which to sort of teach that line of thinking. Programming is a tool with which to solve actual problems. So that rather begs the question here on day two, what is programming? if this is what much of this semester is going to be spent on. What is it? Surely one of you knows. Programming. I like the awkward silence, so <laughs> the first voice will put an end to it. Programming. OK, so good. It's creating a set of instructions. Someone else, elaborate. It's always easier to elaborate on someone else's idea, right? Kind of gets it going. What's programming? You must know. Otherwise, why are you even all here? You must have a sense of why you're here. Using a specified language to carry out actions by a set of instructions. Wow, OK. Using a specified language to carry out a set of instructions. So that's good. Hey, let's more colloquial, right? Like, how would you describe programming to say your mom, your dad, your friends? Good, telling a computer what to do. And ultimately, that really is what it boils down to. It doesn't so much matter what language it is you're using, Scratch today, C on Monday, PHP 10 weeks from now, but rather that you have this ability to sort of communicate with this machine and tell it what you want it to do. And the interesting thing, as we'll see throughout this semester, is that solving problems isn't always just about solving them at all or solving them correctly, but rather solving them well, solving them efficiently. So in that sense, let's consider a fairly simple real world example. So here's a really big phone book with some 1,500 pages in it. So consider the very simple real world problem of looking up a phone number in this phone book. Well, how do I do it? I want to go ahead and look up some name or some, I want to look up uh, a paint store in this book. So what am I going to do? Binary search. <laughs> <laughs> I, I what? Binary search. Yes, we'll get to that in a couple weeks' time. Let me, allow me to introduce you to the hacker edition at that point. For those of you who just know how to live your daily lives, what, how do you go about <laughs> finding a paint store in a phone book? <laughs> Sorry? Look for P, OK? So let's keep it simple here, right? It's only day one. So I open the phone book. Obviously, it starts with A. So I continue flipping. I get to C. Now I'm at M, N, O. And here I am in the P section of the phone book. So what do I do at this point? I found the first page of the P section. What do I now do? OK, so go on to the next letter A. So I sort of refine my search and maybe more slowly start flipping these pages. But in the end, suppose that. Uh, it takes me a while. Suppose that 
you know, it's not on the first page certainly that I choose, and I have to keep flipping. I mean, in theory, if these phone books are, say, 1,000 pages, 1,500 pages, just in the worst case, if you take this very simple, very correct, yet there's a naive approach to finding the letter P in the phone book, I mean, how many pages might you end up flipping before you actually get to the answer you're looking for? So, OK, good. So good. A lot. Right? And actually, I'm in the white pages section. If I want to be in, in the P section for the paint stores, I actually really start flipping through this book such that I don't even get to P until page uh, 1011 in this book. So you flip maybe 1,000 pages. And maybe you're a bit smarter than that, right? And you don't start at the front of the phone book looking for P. You sort of estimate where it is in the book. But computers, you know, they can't just estimate where things are. They can't just open to the P section, so to speak, unless you tell them how to do that or to tell them to do that at all. So consider then the size of this problem quite literally. It's a big phone book. There's a lot of pages. In the worst case, we might have to flip the page a thousand times executing this procedure, this algorithm for finding the letter P. Can we do better? Yes. OK, yes, clearly, because we heard it the first time there. So what can we do? And unfortunately, the, the nomenclature is a bit spoiled. You can do something called binary search, but Maybe not knowing what that even means, can someone else, again, from daily life, sort of propose a more um, just intuitive approach? OK, perfect. So you know P just by knowing your alphabet is in the second half of the alphabet. So at least you can open to, say, the middle of the phone book at step one. And you just know that what is true about this side of the phone book? All right, it's not going to be there. And here are some histrionics for the sake of making this class memorable. So I flipped. <laughs> I flip to the middle of the book, but quite literally now I can throw that half <laughs> of the pro silly, but you'll remember it. I'm literally throwing that half of the book away. So now I'm left quite literally with a problem that's half as big as it was just a moment ago. Contrast this with the first approach. I start at page one, I'm in A. I flip a few pages, maybe I'm in B. C, D. It takes me several steps just to get to the start of P. Odds are I'm much closer. In fact, right now I'm around the M section here. All right, so what do I do next? I now have a problem that's half as big left. What do I do next along these lines? Perfect. So let's just repeat, right? The first approach worked pretty well. Let's steal that idea, go with it again, split it right here in the middle. I seem to be in the R section. So what do I want to do? Ah, now I can throw away the other. <laughs> the sad thing is, right, you don't want these kinds of demos to blow up in your face. So I actually spent this morning tearing apart phone books to make sure I didn't embarrass myself today. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have a problem that's not only half the size of the previous one, but it's, it's a quarter of the size of the original problem. Now let's just follow this train of logic. Let's split it again. It looks like I'm all the way back to n. So I'm going to go ahead and tear this in half, get rid of this half. Now I have a problem that's 1 8 the size of the original problem. And that's only after three steps. So I continue along these lines, splitting, splitting, splitting. And then ultimately, intuitively, what page are you going to end up on so long as you keep checking whether you should go left or go right in this fashion? You should end up on that right page. So you've started with a book, a problem that's maybe a thousand pages long. And in the original naive approach, it might take you 500 steps, a thousand steps to follow this very linear page by page approach. But contrast that now with this approach. Those of you uh, who are fans of mathematics, if this thing has, let's say, 1,024 pages in it, how many times am I going to have to split it in half? <laughs> before I find the page I'm looking for? 10. 10, right? These are just powers of 2. Now, that's all fine and good. 10 steps, not so bad. Certainly better than several hundred. But just consider how this kind of thinking, this kind of algorithm scales. If I instead have a phone book or just a database, let's say, that's a million pages long, how many times can you split that thing in half until you whittle, whittle, whittle the problem down to just one database record or one page, if it's a million to start with? Yeah, it's actually like 20, 22, 24, somewhere in that range. Let's scale up even bigger. Suppose your database, or God forbid, your phone book has 4 billion pages in it. This sounds huge. It would certainly take forever to flip through all of those pages. But take this uh, binary search approach, splitting the thing again and again, 
How many times can you split four billion pages apart until you're left with just one? Yeah, there's that. It's roughly 32, depending on exactly how we round. Like, that is significant. That is compelling to take a problem that large and whittle it down so efficiently. So much of the processes in this course are, not, are going to be not only about solving problems and getting your programs to work, but ultimately, later in the semester, getting them to work well, getting them to work efficiently, and considering exactly what the trade-offs are for doing so. So let's see if we can't make the, uh, this idea a little more real. And actually, before I distract your attention with reading ahead, let's consider another simple real-world example. I want to count how many people are in this room. So perhaps the simplest, most naive approach would be one, two, three, four. And maybe I'm jotting down someone's name, but very procedurally, I'm going iteratively through the entire group until finally I count up 200, 300 people and then we're done. So needless to say, that's a little tedious. If we did that in class, you probably wouldn't be too pleased with me. And it would take a long time. So can we do better? Well, binary search isn't quite the right term here, at least, because it's not like I'm looking right now for one of you in particular, but just trying to count you all. But can we do better? Well, I argue, in fact, that we can. And this is going to be one of those awkward demonstrations, less for me and more for you, where I need you to humor me, even though it's a little cramped in here, and I need you all if you would, just stand up. You are about to count yourselves, hopefully faster than I or one of the teaching fellows could, simply by executing this program, this pseudocode of sorts. So excellent. You've all done step one very well. Step two, assign yourself the number one. So this is the easy part. Think to yourself, I am the number one. <laughs> number three, find someone else that's standing up. That too should be easy. Just pair off, essentially. That's great. Nice to meet you all. All right, number four, add your number to that person's number. All right, quick sanity check. What number should all of you have? Two. Two. Go ahead, repeat as follows on the board. Only a few people standing. Pair off. <laughs> OK, so you can sit down. You two are left. OK. OK, so pair off. I'm not involved. Okay, and Andrew? 73. <laughs> so, um. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's the total you came to? 260. 260. Okay, anyone else left standing that's actually been involved in this process? Two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're up to 262. Anyone else? No? You had what? You have three, but you're sitting still. OK. <laughs> 265, one man left standing. What's your name, by the way? Luke. Luke. OK, Luke is with 265 in mind. Uh, how many did I count during this process? What's the correct answer? <laughs> I'm going to go 
on a limb, but just because this demonstration never actually works, that there are not 265 people in here. But actually, that's pretty close. So let's actually, if we could, because he's still standing awkwardly, give Luke a round of applause. <laughs> Let's assume that was correct, and we'll check it later by counting how many handouts are left over, and then and then laugh or or uh, pass that news along. But let's consider now the implications of what we just did. So 265. So for me, it in theory would have taken me 265 steps to count all of you. The question then at hand is how many steps or how many sort of loops did all of you execute to come up with that answer 265? I mean, how many times did you go through this process, much like I was going through my process? A lot. So, OK, a lot. Now we've got to start getting a little more sophisticated. So it's not just a lot, but yeah. well, so not 264. So there were many of you participating, but how many rounds? How many times did someone go back to step three in that sort of iterative process. Well, the flip it around. How many times did we divide the room, essentially, in half? And yeah, I've heard it called out a couple times. If there are roughly 265 of us in this room, then in theory, we had only eight, maybe nine rounds of this pairing off and then having half of you sit down. Pair off, half of you sit down. Because the problem literally was getting halved getting halved, getting halved. And now granted, there's more steps for you than perhaps for each fall of my finger. And we'll come back to what the implications are for the fact that you're executing maybe every three steps for every one of mine. But the conclusion we'll come to in the weeks to come is that those kinds of constant factors, those kinds of nitty gritty details, when you start talking about really big problems, millions of records, billions of records, they just end up not mattering, both, math math both mathematically and then also sometimes in practice. I saw a hand go up over here. Yes, no? Yeah. What if someone took two handouts or didn't take a handout at all? OK, so good, good ca corner case, as we'll call them. What if one of you uh, took two handouts or no handouts at all? Uh, well, fortunately, those two cases cancel themselves out. <laughs> so <laughs> it won't be a problem in this class. Other questions? <laughs> this, again, is really just motivation, then, for where we're going now. And we're going to try to formalize what we've just executed, which is but a procedure, an algorithm, a set of instructions, if you will. We implemented that as humans, reading off pseudocode, sort of English-like, but clearly very methodical language on the board. Let's now try to formalize some of the things that come to mind when you do start executing algorithms, or really programs. So this is an algorithm, a procedure, that is, for what kind of activity, it seems. All right, so putting your socks on in the morning. So let's just tease apart some of the nomenclature. For those of you who have taken APCS or just any kind of programming, this is all old hat, but we'll quickly move on beyond this. So this thing at the top of the, at the at line one, let socks on feet equal zero. So even if you've never programmed before, it's not hard to imagine that this is just what we call a variable of sorts. It's like a placeholder just to keep track of some value or where we are. That makes sense because we've named it appropriately that by default when I wake up, presumably, the number of socks on my feet starts at zero. So we set that so-called variable accordingly. So this thing in line two is what we'll start calling just a loop. It's something that's going to repeat multiple times. It's really not hard to wrap your mind around that for this kind of procedure. The syntax there, which is, again, in this amalgam of like English, and then in this case, C or C++-like syntax, is essentially saying, while you don't have two socks on your feet, proceed to do the following. Right? Simple as that. So all of this indentation now is meant to just convey visually what you should be doing while socks on feet is not equal to two. So we indent with line three and beyond because we're going to do the following set of instructions. Open the sock drawer. Look for your sock. And then in step five, we hit what we're going to start calling a branch or a condition. Again, intuitively, it's pretty straightforward. If you find a sock, then Presumably, you're going to go about putting it on. But again, follow the indentation. Fast forward to line, uh, line 16, and notice the if and that else now line up. So if you don't find a sock, what are you going to do? Just to do a quick sanity check. Do laundry and replenish your sock drawer. So I won't belabor this point, because at the end of the day, not a terribly interesting algorithm. But what it does capture already here on day two is the type of thinking that we're be going to begin to try to mold you around. Taking for granted very simple algorithms is sort of a common day occurrence. But when you actually need to tell a computer 
what to do. This level of precision, this level of, um, of methodology is terribly important because computers can't just read between the lines or make assumptions as to what you want it to do. You have to tell it everything. Unfortunately, if we were to feed this to a computer or even a human, there's a problem with this program. This program already has a so-called bug or mistake. And in fact, there's probably many of them, some worse than others. What's a problem with this program if you yourself were to execute it tomorrow morning? OK, if there's only one sock in the drawer, so you've identified it. Let me turn to someone else who didn't notice that yet. What's the problem if there's only one sock in the drawer? And back. Was that a hand or a scratch? Just a scratch, all right? And this back. So you're obviously never going to find the second sock. So what's the implication? Yeah, so you get stuck in what we'll start calling now an infinite loop. The program doesn't seem to handle that condition very well. So know now, the first time you write a program for this course, that when you type your command at the command line, hit Enter, waiting for your result, and nothing happens, odds are you just fail to consider what might eventually just be a very obvious case or scenario. But that's not so good if you're writing computer software. If any of you have had this very common occurrence of using your Windows machine or your Mac OS machine, and for some reason a program just starts hanging. It's still running, and your computer's not frozen, but it seems like AOL Instant Messenger is just doing something without you even being involved. Or maybe your browser is just doing something, and maybe things start slowing down, but nothing really is happening. Well, many things can explain that, but among the explanations are these mistakes that some program at AOL or Microsoft made known as a bug, an infinite loop. That program, IE or AOL Instant Messenger, is just stuck spinning its wheels doing something again and again because some human, some programmer perhaps, made a mistake, either an, um, one that was easily overlooked or something that was um, should have been more obvious. So that was what we call pseudocode. And it's a way of expressing yourself in terms another human can understand, but certainly not a computer. If we need to start telling a computer what to do, what we'll start doing on Monday is feeding it instructions, feeding it syntax like this. So this is an instance of the programming language known as C. If this looks a little cryptic to you, don't worry. It will soon become old hat. But you can kind of get a sense of what this program, if we were to feed it into a computer, does just by glancing at it. So among you who have never written a program before, what does this do? Prince, hello world. right? So there's really not going to be much magic there. But there is, with languages like C, a lot of distractions early on. Most of you in this room who have never programmed before will end up wasting minutes, if not more, of your life banging your head against the wall, so to speak, because you left out at some point in this course a semicolon, or a quotation mark is out of place, or a parenthesis is missing. These kinds of minutia are important for the computer, because it needs to be able to expect character after character in sort of a very logical form. But for a human, you know, even we in you know, everyday writing make typographical errors. Not acceptable when it comes to programming. And unfortunately, those kinds of syntactical, that kind of syntactical harshness poses a problem for a lot of aspiring programmers, because it just gets in the way of the ideas. And so what we're doing this week, and this week alone, today and on Friday, is introducing rather the concepts of programming, the ideas behind programming by way of this environment called Scratch before we transition quickly on Monday to the more arcane but much more, more expressive and powerful syntax of C. What happens underneath the hood when you actually run a program through a computer? Well, as you'll see in just a week's time, you write the stuff that looks like that at top left. That's what we're going to call source code. It's sort of human legible, but clearly there's some kind of computer-like structure to it. You're then going to take your source code, and you're going to run it through a special program called a compiler. We're going to be doing this usually on Linux machines in the course, but compilers exist for Mac OS, Windows. Nothing of what, not, none of what we do is fundamentally tied to Linux in this course. What a compiler spits out, though, is this stuff, which is quite clearly an instance of binary, yeah, binary right? Zeros and ones. Those zeros and ones that ultimately are the only things that computers understand. Humans back in the day, perhaps, might have very well needed to program their computers by way of zeros and ones, or little switches, or punch cards, things with holes in them, because you were literally that close to the hardware. These days, we tend to program in much higher level languages, so to speak, like C, which are closer to English than they are to binary uh, zeros and ones. And we might say that Scratch is sort of 
of one level further up that, tra、uh, up that tree. A little more、um, intuitive to master. And so that's where we begin today. Hello World, written in this programming environment known as Scratch, is as simple as this. So you've seen Andrew's work, you've seen a couple of former students' works. Allow me to introduce you. To this programming environment. So, what you will be doing for problem set zero and essentially over the course of the next week is immersing yourself in this environment. It's not so important for lecture that we point out each and every feature. The fact of the matter is, this software is, fairly,、uh, is very easy to pick up on one's own. What we'll introduce today and on Friday are both、uh, introductory and then more sophisticated things that you can do with this particular environment. And with Problem Set Zero, we will unleash you on this environment so that you too can come up with something along the lines of, say, Andrew's work that is either funny or cute or just downright amazing. Those of you who have programmed before are therefore challenged to strive to win. The so called most amazing award that Problem Set Zero describes. So, we've again tried, we, even within this problem set, to establish two little tracks. So, even if you've had programming before, well, that's fine. Just impress us even more with this particular environment. Those of you who have never programmed before, don't worry about pursuing the so called、uh, most amazing award, but just get the job done and do something that's of interest to you, something that you find fun and exciting over the next week. Though, also for perhaps that crowd, we will also be bestowing two other awards besides most amazing at the、uh, submission of this problem set. We will be awarding the cutest award and the funniest award. So, you two can strive for those. So, what's this environment all about? You're going to download for problem set zero, Scratch, from MIT's website, since this environment is a project from MIT's Media Lab. They originally designed it for、uh, children within after school programs. <laughs> <laughs> Bad way to introduce that, huh? <laughs> Fix the language next time. No, so it, quite literally, it was designed for children in after school programs to really engage them intellectually and sort of、um, interactively with computers in after school programs.、Um, I was introduced to this when I met the faculty member there, Mitch Resnick, and his team of researchers and grad students who put together this environment really for pedagogical purposes and not just as, say, a plaything for children. We actually here at Harvard, within the summer school, extension school, and also in the college,、um, have rather usurped. The environment for use in these introductory courses for all of the reasons we enumerated on Monday. That it allows you on day one to really dive headfirst into this world of programming and to master some of the basic concepts, loops, iteration,、um, Boolean expressions, and statements, and events, and even threads without all of the arcane syntax, like something like C. So, With that said, how does this thing work? Well, you open this thing up once you've downloaded and installed it. It works on Macs and PCs alike. Problem set zero will walk you through this process. And here is the world in which you will be playing. At left here, we have essentially what are programming instructions. All of these are blue here. They seem to be related to motion. So there's categories of blo、uh, building blocks or puzzle pieces at top left here. So motion involves all of these blocks here. If I instead, though, go to control, We'll see one that we've seen a moment ago with that Hello World example. All of the programming that you will do with this environment boils down, quite simply, to dragging and dropping these puzzle pieces. And they will interlock automatically, and then together, when executed, we'll implement programs again like Andrew's. How do you do that? Well, Besides these puzzle pieces, at the bottom right of the screen, you have a list of all of your so called sprites. These are the characters that you can program against within this world. At top right, you have the so called stage. That's where all of the sprites live and will move around and might interact with the user. And then right here in the middle, in this blank column, is the so called scripts area. This is where you actually, quote unquote, write your program. So if I want to have this little、uh, cat here simply announce to the world, hello world, well, We might drag that block there. I'm going to go ahead and drag this block here. Putting it close enough means it will lock together. Rather than say hello, I'm going to have it say exactly what I want it to say, which was hello world. I'm going to go ahead and click the green flag, and I've just written my first, if underwhelming, program. And that's really what this environment is going to boil down to. So let's try to take things up a notch, but teach you ultimately today and on Friday, not Scratch. It is not an interesting thing to tell your friends, I know how to program in Scratch. <laughs> the point 
of this immersion, though, is to teach you and is to begin to get you in the mindset, especially if you don't have, say, a PCS behind you, in the mindset of what it is to program. So that come next week when we introduce a more traditional language like C, you just know what we mean by a Boolean variable or a Boolean expression, a loop and a condition, all old hat to you by then. And the syntax is all you'll need to begin to pick up at that point. So these things here are examples of what we will henceforth call statements. These are just sort of atomic operations that do something. We will see the analogs of these in the world of C. But for now, things like say hello, wait one second, play the following sound. Those are just statements, instructions that compel the sprite, the character, to do something. Well, what can we do? Well, let's make something more, slightly more interesting than hello world. At left here, those non-programmers among you, what is that program going to do when I click Scratch's green flag? Yeah, just shout it out, right? This one's pretty easy. All right, it's going to say hello world for one second. It's going to pause. It's going to say it again. It's going to pause. And it's going to say it again. End of program. So not all that much magic. Let's just use this as an example of actually importing this stuff. Um, all of the files that we'll play with today and on Friday are downloadable via the course's website. As you might imagine, you click a button like Open, navigate, say, to my desktop, where inside of this folder I've put all of those projects, including some of the ones we demoed on Monday. And this was Hello2. Open it up, and what we see is that this program here obviously has just one sprite, that cat. It's got one script, so to speak, one program in the middle. If I go ahead and click that green flag, again, the effect will be underwhelming, but predictable. Hello world, hello world, three times over. So we can already, though, begin to tease out some of the motivations for more complicated constructs in programming. Imagine that we didn't want this cat to say hello world three times, but 10 times. Again, those non-programmers among you, how do I make this cat say hello world uh, 10 times instead of three? All right, so I can just, uh, what do I want to do? Well, I want him to wait another second. So I can say, all right, wait one second. I can go to looks, say hello, and I can change the text there to be hello world. Right, you can very quickly see how this gets boring and where this is going. Right? I can do that seven more times. So clearly already there's this scalability issue that we trip over, where that kind of coding, one becomes tedious. And what's another counter argument to just listing 10 pairs of these blocks? All right, so it's uh, perhaps resource inefficient, I heard. It's, I heard the word change, so it's difficult to change something. If I just want to change what the cat's saying, I now have to change it in 10 places instead of just one. So already, even with these silly little examples, you sort of appreciate that with programming, you want the ability not just to do things, but again, to do things more elegantly, more efficiently. Because one of the resources involved in programming a computer is not just CPU cycles and disk space and the amount of memory your computer has, but also you, the developer's time, how much time it takes to write that program and make the computer what you want it to do, and how much time it takes you, the programmer, to maintain that program. So we need something like a loop, as we saw earlier in pseudocode. This one on the left is introduced not so much because it's fundamentally different, but just because this is where the sort of silliness from this environment, in a good way, begins to derive. In Hello3, I have a very loud cat. OK, so that too is just going to repeat three times. Well, let's take things up a notch. How can we start making things more interesting than that? Well, in programming in general, and certainly in C and in Scratch, there are these things called Boolean expressions, quite literally named after a gentleman by the last name of Bool. These expressions are things that are either true or they're false. So Boolean simply implies, henceforth, uh, one of two things, true, false, one, zero, on, off. Any of those are really synonymous, henceforth. So what might be true or false in this world of Scratch? Well, you're either uh, the sprite is either touching the mouse pointer, that is the cursor, or it's not, true or false. The mouse button is either down or it's not, true or false. Something is a number is either less than another number or it's not. True or false. And finally, two things are either both true, sort of a recursive definition here, or they're not. False. Well, why are those kinds of things useful? Well, sometimes you only want the computer to do something sometimes and under certain circumstances. So you have this very intuitive notion that we'll formalize here as a condition. So if you want a computer program in general to do something, you deploy a condition. In Scratch, it happens to look like that thing at top left, where, see, there's a little 
uh, uh, little placeholder, a special shape that perfectly fits the shape of these Boolean expressions. The idea is that you drag and drop those true or false possibilities right onto the condition. And then if it's true, the code that's inside of this condition that fits into that little um, into the space between the shape will either execute or it won't. And you can stagger these things. If you want the program to do this or that, you're going to use a construct like the middle, or you can certainly layer these things. So let's now actually deploy these, some verbally, some in practice. At left, really fast, what does the left program do if we were to execute it? OK, so it's always going to play the sound meow. So in this case, this is clearly a foolish use of the idea of a Boolean expression. But if we actually put one of those things known as a variable, some placeholder that can change, very quickly do constructs like that, x less than y, become more useful if the values can actually change. Well, Scratch supports things like pseudo random numbers. For now, random numbers, where you can pick a num you can have Scratch pick a number between x and y. In this program, it writes, Sort of in this English sentence, what does that program do if executed? Yeah? It's going to play this meow sound only half of the time, right? Because if you pick a number from 1 to 10 randomly, only if it's 1 through 5 is it actually going to be true. And so this was hello 5. If I open this up, go ahead and run it. Well, happened that time. Didn't happen that time. Happened that time. You can do this 100 times, and hopefully we'd get roughly 50-50 with each. Well, again, let's very quickly make this progression so we don't dwell on what's otherwise fairly intuitive, loops. If you want to deploy the idea of a loop, an iterative process in Scratch, you simply deploy a construct like this. The one at left obviously is going to do what's tucked inside of it forever. The other one is only going to do it a fixed number of times. How can we actually make interesting use? Well, the one at left. Again, softball. What does the program at left do? Right, so it's just going to meow ad infinitum every two seconds. And I won't force that one on you. But how about hello7? Let's go ahead and open up hello7. All right, so now nothing seems to be happening. What's the problem? All right, so you actually have to touch it with the cursor and then, OK, so it's like petting the cat, right? Silly. <laughs> Oh, the cutest award, perhaps. Right. So what about this one at right? Well, it's got now this, this two uh, branching condition. So either if something's true, the program is conceptually going to go this way, else it's going to go this way, executing the blocks that are nested inside of either branch. Well, let's load up this one, which again was hello8. Well, this one, if we play this. It looks like it's just going to meow every two seconds, as you would expect, because right now it's not touching the mouse pointer. If you go ahead and touch the cat, though, <laughs> don't pet the cat. All right, so again, simple examples, certainly simple ideas, but that's exactly the point of this environment, is that if you want to achieve some task, solve some problem, if you will, it just lowers the bar so significantly that the programming itself just doesn't get in the way of the implementation of your idea. Well, let's now consider how we can do yet more interesting, those simple things. So Scratch certainly supports this idea of variables. So if you want to sort of keep a value around and maybe even change some value over time, we might do something like this <coughs> at left. Well, what's this thing going to do exactly? Well, it's going to set some variable. Looks like it's called counter to 1. And then forever, it's going to say the value of the counter. It's going to wait one second. It's going to change the value of the counter by plus 1. And it's going to repeat. If I go ahead and open count.sb, this file here, what we have is, again, underwhelming to be sure. But again, it's sort of a step toward more interesting programs. At right here, what's that program going to do? So it's really just like a version 2 of that simple random number program we saw a moment ago. What does this one do in English? So this time, it's going to pick a random number, obviously, from 1 to 10. But it's going to tell you what the number was, which is maybe good just to confirm our intuition. And then it's not just going to say it, but it's actually going to meow. So let's go ahead and open Hello9, the ninth version in this series. Let's go ahead and play this. And incidentally, the way we were blowing things up earlier, Scratch has this so-called presentation mode if you want to impress your friends. But for now, we'll just keep running it there. So now? It's 
Oh, no, wait, what happened? Oh, oh, right, yeah, so I'm looking like an idiot waiting for it to keep going. <laughs> so why is it not going still? There's no, oops, see how I flipped that around, right? A little instructive example. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look now at this, because movement would certainly make these programs more interesting. So in move one, let's go ahead and just run this thing first. I'm going to go ahead to open, no, uh, move one, play this. And this one does have a forever loop, so the cat is. Oh. <laughs> and that's all it's going to do is start bouncing off of the walls. How does this work? Well, and again, just to give you a sense of the means by which you'll interface with this, it's all about these puzzle pieces. If I want to start moving things around, it literally is as simple as clicking and dragging. If I want to pull that thing out, notice that the blocks resize themselves. They maintain the same shape conceptually and visually, but they allow things to be snapped inside and they grow to fill the construct. So if I put this thing back together, you see that the way by which we were implementing movement is the following. First, if the cat, the sprite, is touching the edge, it's going to play that sound, it's going to bounce, it's going to turn itself 15 degrees, and then going to move two steps, two pixels, like two dots on the screen. Otherwise, if it's not hitting the edge, it's just going to keep moving step by step. Well, one of the nice things about Scratch 2, unlike a lot of traditional languages, is that you can change things on the fly without, as we'll see, recompiling them. The cat now will get much faster by moving five steps instead of one. I don't know how far we want to push them. OK. <laughs> OK. So. The takeaway from that, though, is that the programming environment itself is very dynamic. You can literally see immediately the kinds of changes you're making to your program. Yeah? How does the cat know which way to turn when it hits the wall? Why does it like, turn in phases sometimes? Uh, so why does the cat, how does the cat know which direction to turn? So when the cat is moving, it's moving along a fixed trajectory, a vector. When it hits the wall, it's turning specifically 15 degrees clockwise in this case. And so it's, it's sort of like striking balls off of a, um, like a, a pool table, but you're specifying the angle against which it should bounce off the wall. OK, I, I just don't see why, like, if it's going up into the wall here, why it doesn't turn so he's facing down toward the wall. He's turning clockwise. So I think if it goes like this, he should turn himself. Uh, what it might, I'd have to look more carefully. What it might be doing is flipping him around and then rotating it slightly. But I'd have to look more closely at those details. But a good question. I'll take a look afterward. So now let's introduce a second sprite to make these things more interactive. So now we have the source code, so to speak, the scripts for two different sprites, one a cat, one a mouse. Rather than walk through the code, it's rather self-explanatory if we simply open up move two. So move two now looks like this. Notice that the cat sprite is highlighted in the bottom right, which is why we're seeing Oh, yes, his script. But if I instead click the bird sprite, what we see is his script being executed. Well, again, both of them are being executed in lockstep. Okay. So where can we go with this? Well, notice that there are these other capabilities. And notice that none of these programs thus far, those sort of visually they've gotten more interesting and more dynamic, they're still quite small. And that, too, sort of speaks to the expressiveness of this environment. This program here is an instance of something that we're going to call threads. Inherent in most computers and operating systems today is this ability to do multiple things at once. This is why you are able to run AOL Instant Messenger and Microsoft Word and Internet Explorer all at the same time. Your odds are your computer only has one CPU, or core, so to speak. But computers these days create the illusion of doing multiple things simultaneously by scheduling each of the programs on your computer to get just a few milliseconds, maybe, of their attention before they switch their attention, the CPUs, to the next program, the next program. And because we humans aren't really that fast, certainly compared to computers, we don't actually see that Microsoft Word is doing a little bit of work, then AOL, then Internet Explorer. The computer creates this illusion of parallelism when really it's just multitasking. Well, this here is another example of not two sprites, but one sprite with two scripts such that both of them will be executed at the same time. Thus, this program, the Scratch program, is using what's called two threads. Two threads executing effectively simultaneously. In English, what can I do with this program based on the source code? So I can hit the space bar and turn off 
that sound. So you can have this intercommunication between the two sprites. I'm going to give you a sneak preview then of this last example, which I actually stole from someone at MIT who made it. But let us say, for today's purposes, that come Friday, our first volunteer of the day will have uh, the experience, perhaps, of, of punching the instructor. So we will see you on Friday. <laughs>